Hi, I'm Margaret Hadfield. I'm an Australian professional artist. My videos are intended to give you a really good grounding and also to enhance your existing art practice or to help you on your way as a total beginner. It is not necessary for you to have previous experience. I teach across all mediums and I'm really happy to share my experience and my knowledge with you. Participating in the creative arts provides health and well-being benefits which everyone can use. I regularly connect with my community via Facebook and I share my students' creations as well as my own. Thank you to my Patreons and remember to like and subscribe if you wish to see more of my videos as I release them. Thank you. Keep calm and paint. I got some plants that I put in pots, a money tree for luck and forget me not. Hi, I'm Margaret Hadfield and uh, welcome to my watercolour class, or water medium class today. This is um, a session where I'm just devoting to watercolour. Been painting forever, almost, and um, selling paintings since I was 13. But the strange thing is that classes and giving classes um, pushes me into different mediums. So traditionally I'm sort of more acrylic and, and oil. But I love it all, and that's what you'll find about most artists, is they love all mediums. And I don't like being pocketed into one particular genre or one particular medium. I think it's all amazing fun and all, all good, and I think you can learn from them all as well. You can use watercolour techniques with oil um, and acrylic. You can, you know, do, do various things. And there are many mediums within watercolour as well. So watercolour is transparent and it needs to be transparent. Um, some people bring uh, white gouache into watercolour and really technically that's not true watercolour because gouache is a medium that's more opaque. So it's just uh, watercolour is pigments of colour, just pigments and you, you don't use white. There is a white watercolour, but it's still fairly transparent, so you can lighten the colour. But um, generally, you, you lighten the colour by adding water, as simple as that. So, but you never use the paint on its own. And um, I'm just thought I might touch and just get you into the mood and get, get you into um, having a feel for watercolour. I've got a few examples here. This. Um, of, of some watercolour that I have done. This, uh, this is a portrait done from, from life and it's, um, uh, how I'd go about that is I would do a little light sketch of the, the young lady's face and I would do a light base colour, which is probably this one here. So with watercolour, you start light and you get gradually get darker and that's the only way to achieve um, uh, you know, a likeness, I suppose, of anything, is to start light and you gradually get darker into the, into the face or whatever it is you're doing. So you can see number one, and then there's just layering of slightly darker colours. With a portraiture, I might add, is the detailing of the eyes and the mouth and the nose is lost. You sort of build shadows into the, into the eye socket, down the side of the nose, around the chin, you just gradually, it, it, you become informed where they are. So a lot of people want to go straight to the eyes or straight to the mouth, outline a mouth. You know, you, you don't, don't do that. You, you really go to that later on. So you just slow the whole process down a little bit. Show you a few more. It does to get you into the swing of it. There's my hand, a little bit in the dark side. Must be this one, that one there. Um, again, started a light colour, which is this one here, and gradually got darker. So these, I'll just sort of run you through a little quickly. I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, the, I've got a, a seagull here. So this seagull obviously has white on it, so that gets left. The white is the paper, and it's, um, so it's, it's 
quite easy. You can just leave that white, soften it away, and, and that's, that's fine. But there are incidents, and actually this one here too, um, this is a flannel flower, where um, I could just go around it, drew the flower, go around, bleed this lovely blue uh, indigo colour, I think it was, and let it bleed around it, dry it off, and then come in and shadow the white flower or put yellow in. Um, so it was kind of, I could easily go around that. So if you wet it and then add the colour, let it bleed, it'll, the, the pigment will only go where you've wet it. So that's, um, that's that. Now I have, um, there's a few here, lots of little samples, a kangaroo paw. That might even be ink, that one. Sometimes it's really hard to tell. I've been, um, been to Antarctica a few times, just bragging. Um, here's an iceberg, which is easy to leave the white because it's a big bulky area of white, gradually shadow down and shadow into the waters. And uh, the, the thing is, when you want to have white left, the, um, here's a um, daffodil, there's no white on that one. When you have, want to add, when you, you could, you can actually add a medium called masking fluid. This is some um, pretty old bottle. It's not that old, it's just uh, messy. Um, you can paint in the masking fluid. So I have put masking fluid on these flowers and this one, the tree. And when I have completed the piece, I have rubbed it off and I've, I'm left with the white. So I've rubbed it with the ball of my finger. This stuff here is just, when it's lovely and wet, I have thrown salt on it, which gives a lovely dandy dandelion effect, which is quite fun. A bit of an extra splash there. <laughs> anyway, these are just sort of samples of bits and pieces I've done in classes. And uh, here's another one where I've put masking fluid on the little flowers. Otherwise, how are you going to leave that white? You know, it's going to be hard work to leave all those little bits. Um, this one here, when you have a big mountain, a big um, volcano like that with snow on top, it's a large space, so you don't need masking fluid for that. But I did use masking fluid for the tree. Um, I put a little bit of soft grey on it, a bit of pinky stuff on it, but I did mask the tree. So it was a comb combination. But like that area didn't need it, but this area does. Now, masking fluid on the frog. So I put little bits there to show the shine. Otherwise, it's too hard for you to leave it. So that's um, a really great tool to use. And I'll be using that in a moment. And I'll, I'll show you, I will put some on a tree branch. So that's a good example of masking areas for shine, little spot on the eye of the frog. And uh, it's beautiful, beautiful fun. Right there, I've got a little bit of granulation happening. I, I love that sort of separation of the, paint, of the pigments as well. The, um, let's see what else is here, That's the hand. The, um, the other mediums, some of the other mediums like, um, this is ink. I tend to use ink very vibrant and, and bold and you can see how colourful that is. You would never know that was ink. It's, uh, it looks like watercolour, performs like watercolour, but it's actually ink. And ink I particularly love because it doesn't move. It actually doesn't shift. When you start to work over the top, the colour's stuck, it's there. Whereas you find if you work over the top of watercolour, it can move again, the pigments can move and, and shift around. You can create sort of cauliflowers on your paper. So with ink, that tends not to happen. You just have that one colour and it's stuck there. So that's kind of why I do like like that. This is an example of very loose ink, not by myself, but it's got gold and it's very loose and bleedy and, and I just like to include that because I love Colleen's works. Um, you would never know that was ink, but it's ink. And, and this one here is, a, 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 you can really see how I've undercoated a yellow coating here and I'm able to work over the top of that after it was set. So I, um, just a bit of a, an example, you've heard of gouache. Gouache is the opaque watercolour and gouache has its own issues. 
It's beautiful. You can work white with gouache over the top. And so it's a bit more borderline acrylic, but it's not an acrylic. It performs like a watercolour. I can wash it out like a watercolour. Um, I'm allowed to use the white in a much more dense way. But if I accidentally got this wet, it would, it would run off. So it kind of remains active, particularly there where I've got it thicker. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, something you've just got to watch out for. I touched the tail there and it bled. So it's just, uh, just something to be aware of. So it, it does look great. You get it behind glass or plastic straight away because it's easily damaged. And this, was, um, this is also a, gu a gouache done in a watercolour method where I have actually left bits of white. So it's a real in-between. I could probably get away with calling that a watercolour. Uh, just a little sampling. That one, these are all just little samples. You've heard of watercolour pencils. Scrub these. Um, I particularly, there, there are lots on the market, I particularly love these ones which are intense watercolour. This is not an ad by the way. Um, I'm, I just love them because you have amazing colours here and I'll just find a little bit of paper. Here's something where you can put it on. I'll throw some water on that. Look at the colour, it's amazing. And what is different about these is that you can come in, dip your pencil in the water and you can work your pencil like it was a brush. So I just love that ability. And you can also take your pencil and it's watercolour on there, you can just do um, pick up your watercolour off, off the end. So it's um, just something I really love and really recommend. And there's no other brand other than Derwent who are doing that amazing product. So I do, um, do have my little favourites, I suppose. But the colour of those, that um, product is really quite amazing. So here's a few pieces that have been done with, with the pencil. This is a Royal Bluebell from Canberra. I've done... Um, a toucan, but it's very obvious, the pencil marks are very obvious. And of course, uh, a koala. So this um, it hasn't got a lot of water on it. I've just left the pencil a little bit on its own, not so, uh, just a little water, but not too, much, um, not too much on there, just to give you that feeling of the fur. The, these two trees have also been done with the intense watercolour pencils. And they, one is on a rough paper, you can kind of see it's a bit rougher here, and one is on a smoother paper. So they, they've sort of turned out differently because they're two different pieces, but they also um, um, just look a little different, a bit smoother surface. So I was able to sort of just use the pencil direct as a little bit of the squiggles on the, on the gum. But uh, it's, it's, um, it is watercolour, but it just happens to be in a stick form. So I do, do love these various products. The, um, the, other, the other one I've got here is Pan & Wash, which you've probably heard of. Um, we have these Pigma Micron pens, and there's probably a few that are like this that are archival and that are waterproof. So once you have drawn your piece, I'll try not to do it so quickly. Once you have drawn your piece, um, you let it sit for a bit or, or scribbled it in. It's more of a scribble. You, you put your watercolour as a light wash over the top. And it, so this is most of the work. And I think people can overdo the watercolour side of things. Most of the work is done with the pen. And I consider sort of 10% of the work done with the watercolour. Now with the pen, you can see, if you can see, um, the different directions of the pen work is telling the story. So if it's trees, it's a little bit around like that with a few lines downwards. If it's um, clouds, I'm just a bit more gentle. I might sweep underneath 
with the grass tree. I'm coming out like that in directions. It's all about the directions of the marks. Down on the side of the rock, I'm going downwards to show that it's a steep side. I'm showing grasses. So the pen is telling the story and just adding a little bit of colour. It's a lovely thing to do, a really lovely thing to travel with. And um, smooth paper, I recommend, because uh, if it's too lumpy, it, it would just grab hold of it and it won't flow very well. So that's, um, you know, I, I like to hold my pen down uh, continually. I love the continuous line idea as well. And so if you stop and start, the ink is not flowing as well. So just some ideas there for you and hopefully a bit of inspiration uh, as well. These are things that I've always um, enjoyed doing. Uh, it's a simple thing, take a, a pad, a pen and, and a few colours or a little travel pack of watercolour. It's, um, it's really nice and clean and easy and light to take. So um, yeah, just some, just some, some uh, inspiration I hope. Now, there are various types of papers, and I really recommend that you kind of have paper around 300 GSM, the thickness of the paper. Anything less than that will warp, warp terribly. And make sure it is actually watercolour paper. That there are a lot of um, mixtures out there on the market which are maybe 25% uh, cotton. So real watercolour paper is made of cotton. And it's dear, of course, and the um, so just watch out if you don't use wood pulp for for watercolor. It doesn't sit right. It doesn't absorb properly. That you have actually got cotton paper. So there are various um, price ranges, I suppose. The top of the range is Asha's watercolor paper, and there's a few others in between. But um, 300 GSM. Even still, that's going to warp. And I will show you how to tape it down. So uh, you can use uh, regular masking tape, but it's not going to stay there very well. I've got some regular masking tape on this one, but uh, that's all right for a drawing and a little bit of light watercolour, but it's not good enough for a good, a good solid watercolour. So this stuff has been around for, for years. It's called gummed paper tape, and I'll just run it, run it through, just show you how, it, how it's done, basically. That's all. I'll just use my, my towel. If I'm doing a major work, I'll do all four sides. I actually don't find the need to wet the paper. A lot of people do. I think, um, I think it's all been done for you when you buy it. It's all pre-done. So, but that's my opinion. I would do all four sides. That is stuck on there. When that dries, you have to actually cut it off like that on the edge. Um, so it, it adheres amazingly well. So if that got all wet, I, I would do both sides. If it got all wet, it, um, it's not going to lift off. So that's what you want for, for watercolour. Because even though it will warp in the process, it will settle down nice and flat. I've had a situation where I did a fine work and I had these ripples in it and there was nothing I could do to get rid of them. They would just remain there. Uh, I've tried everything, ironing, putting them in to large, under large books. Um, really, you can do it, but you have to risk your piece. You can re-wet it, but you, re you really do risk damaging that piece. Uh, so that's how you would tape it down, a bit of thin craft wood, um, if you were doing a watercolour. For, for a simple thing that I'm demonstrating today, I'm just using the, um, the craft paper, the, that simple tape. The, um, so that basically your brushes as well. Uh, you can spend the earth. I've got some brushes here worth over two hundred dollars. <laughs> Not in this pot, I, um, but there's some certainly some expensive um, brushes. The ha you'll find the the better watercolor artists have these handmade type with the wire around them, and um, you can get really good synthetic ones these days. I don't think you really need to have animal 
They, uh, there's some good synthetics, really fine ones, beautiful ones. Um, and uh, so there's a couple of good brushes there. Even this one here is a nice one for me to use and that'll be fine. What you, what you might find is, um, is it's the difference between a good mop on the floor and, and a cheap mop. So if I pop this in the water, it comes to an amazing point. You can see that lovely point there. It's um, pretty, you know, you, you've got fine lines, you've got a broad mark, and um, so it really just feels lovely. There are some here that I'm, um, well, maybe I don't have them in here. Oh, here we are. This is called a dagger. Um, there's a brush for you. So it's just, I don't know if you can see that. Um, it's really a lovely shaped brush because it, you can use it flat like that, get a bit of water on it, flat across, or you can use it as a, as a point as well. And uh, it's just really nice style of brush. I love that one, a dagger. This one's a Taclon one, which is a synthetic. You can get um, horse hair and different things. But um, yeah, just um, brushes are, are important and um, the style, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get some nice quality brushes. Okay, so I'm going to um, mask, put a bit of masking fluid on this tree branch because I've got some areas of the branch that I want to keep white. So this, um, I've just, I have drawn out just very lightly you do incidentally use a hard pencil to, to draw um, because you don't want this pencil to come in the watercolour. So you use one that's not going to show very much at all. Right, so I'm going to just paint the masking fluid on. It's a latex, it's rubber. So I'll just pop some of this on, won't take me a moment. And I've got a funny bent brush, but it's perfect. So these areas where I place the masking fluid will remain white. I can paint over it when it's dry and it will um, just hold the white of the paper. So this is, as you saw the frog and you saw the other little pieces, the flowers, this is brilliant, just a brilliant tool to use because it's very easy to overpaint and lose your white paper. Okay, I'm done. Can you see the little bits on there? So I've just painted little, little areas of the, the tree with, uh, where, that I want to keep the white. And I'll let it dry now and I'll, I'll move on. So I just wanted to set that up. Okay, so I'll put that away over here. Right, so that's my picture that I kind of use as my example, but it's not going to look exactly like that. It's just, you can see bits of white on the branch there. All right, I'll now move away. So part of uh, being an artist is um, improving your observational skills. And it really is about looking and really learning to look. I'll just move this one a bit away. Um, so I have on the table a pear, as you can see, uh, a fairly green pear, and it's got a, um, a, a lovely shape to it. And I think that's why artists kind of like pears as opposed to apples and oranges. They're, they've just got a, a really nice, a nice shape. Now, there are things going on. There's obviously light and shade going on here. Now, what I have come to notice is that um, it depends what's under the pear. It depends what's behind the pair. There's all sorts of things that's influencing your, the light and shade. And most artists become uh, quite obsessive about light, and I certainly am one of those. Uh, it's just, um, so it's really interesting here, I have part of the mural behind where, where it changes because it's dark behind there, but it's where it's white, it's different. It shifts, so it's, uh, but what is happening here, which I, you possibly can't see at your angle, is a reflection. 
So there's this reflection that's uh, uh, coming back from the paper under the pear. And the darkest area of the pear for me is down here and through the belly. And there's a bit of shadow down the side, a little bit of darkness here, and there's a reflection on the side of the pear. So there's a lot of light in this room, a lot of light bouncing around everywhere. So, but there are bits of light where you wouldn't expect it, such as reflecting back onto it. And that's sort of happening in this tree as well. Uh, it has light reflecting underneath the branch. So strange things happen. And it's just improving your eye to see those things. And I guess that's what I have really developed over the years is my ability to see. And you might think it, you see, but the more you see, the more you see. <laughs> so it's just, uh, you start to realize that maybe you weren't really looking properly. So it's just, uh, when you start to draw or draw to start to paint an, a, an object, like a branch, like a pear, you, you see more and more and it's fascinating. And you think, wow, I didn't see that before, you know, so, I'm going to uh, just have a go at drawing the pear and I'll show you how I go about it because some of you have never done this stuff before. I have a very light touch of my pencil and uh, so I'm not down here like that, nervous and tight. I'm at the end of the pencil and I'm very, very light. So I'm going to start at the top up here I'll call it the neck, the head, top end here. Now, if it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. I have a rubber there, but I, I actually want you to think of your mistakes as being part of the artwork. So I know that's a weird way to think of it, but you know, if you slide off and it's not quite the right place, it doesn't matter. It's part of the artwork. Be um, not such a perfect perfectionist very easy to get too carried away. So you can see I'm just growing the shape of the pear. I have a very light touch. Now I didn't explain my pencil to you. My pencil is a Wolf carbon pencil, which is a crossover from charcoal and graphite. Now why I love these pencils is they are water soluble. So I'm going to add water to it beautiful, beautiful pencil. Um, so I'll keep going. I've got my basic shape here. Um, if it's not perfect, don't hold it against me. I'm just um, showing you the technique. So I'll put a stem. And so now I go in and I shade it down. When you start to gently scribble backwards and forwards, you can see I've got it on an angle. And that way I get a broader mark and I can do it a little quicker. But of course I can't do it there. I've got to be a bit more upright there. If you're a lefty, you, you'd go that way, of course. Um, just gently scribbling. Now the way you make your mark is telling us what the pear, the shape of the pear. So just like um, you are just telling us the direction of this pear, that it's round. So your, your little pencil marks, you can cross hatch, but you can still get a bit of a feel of, of direction going on. I just, um, this paper's got a bit of lovely texture to it. Not sure, just pull that up a bit. I'm holding it down backwards and forwards.
Now, where this shiny bit is, now I should have shined up my pair, but I, I can see light here and I can see light there. Be nice if I polished it, but I won't, I won't move it. Um, I'm just going to give it a bit of light there. And I'm just going to shadow down a little bit more, certainly shadowed there. Now, and underneath. It is a bit darker down that side. So you may not be able to see what I can see, but at least see the method in which I'm, I'm doing this. Now underneath, I'm going to press really hard and there's a lovely shadow, a few little rip dimples in there. It's interesting, sometimes a pair can have odd shapes and sometimes we have pairs with little bottoms. So um, not this one today. <laughs> I'm just going to run the shadow out. Now even though it's a, a, a tabletop, it's um, your, your pen and your, your shadows going around, I want you to consider doing your marks across because it's a flat surface. So that's the thing is I really would like you to consider is your marks are showing that that is flat, you see. So that's why I'm taking it across. Your temptation will be to go that way. But I'm saying, mm, try that way. And that's, that way we'll feel that that's a flat surface there. Um, I think I've just got to do the stem and then I'm ready to add some water. Okay, I'm just check one more time that I'm dark enough through there. Okay, I'm dark enough there. So it's just that final little bit of pressure. All right, now there is a little bit of a cave kind of thing there. All right, okay, so I'm, I'm done with the pencil and I'll add some water onto it now. Thank you to all my subscribers and Patreons and also to DJ Gosper for allowing me to use her wonderful music. Keep calm and paint.